Hey, this is Dr. K from the medical school, and today we're going to talk about acute coronary syndromes, part three. The outline for this series of podcasts is as listed below. Previously, we discussed the coronary blood supply, as well as what is an acute coronary syndrome. We went over the different types of acute coronary syndromes, as well as the pathology behind them. We briefly discussed how to diagnose acute coronary syndromes and started talking about the EKG findings associated with acute coronary syndromes. Now we'll finish that discussion and finish up with management of acute coronary syndromes. Let's begin with ST segment depression. ST segment depression is obviously depression of the ST segment. So the baseline from the S wave from the QRS complex to the T wave is normally not elevated or depressed. When the ST segment section is depressed, usually as compared to the interval from the end of the T to the beginning of the P, this indicates subendocardial ischemia. ST segment depression usually represents reversible ischemia, but does indicate significant atherosclerotic disease, and thus requires further workup. Let's take a look at this EKG. Let's analyze this EKG using Rahibi. So let's start off with the rhythm. The rhythm appears regular. The rate appears to be about 55 beats per minute. Axis appears normal. There is no evidence of significant hypertrophy. Looking at for signs of old and new infarction, in terms of old infarctions, I do not see any Q waves present, but Leads 1 and AVL shows signs of T wave inversion. There is ST depression in leads 2, 3, and AVF. And try to remember what distribution that is. Otherwise, no other indications for infarction. In summation, the evidence of infarction on this EKG are T wave inversions in 1 and AVL, indicating the patient may have had some infarction in the past as well as ST depression in 2, 3, and AVF. Try to remember what distribution that actually is. In identifying ST depression, always compare to the subsequent T to P baseline, that segment between the end of the T wave and beginning of the P wave. Now let's talk about the most important finding in EKG, ST elevations. ST elevations are a rise in the ST segment and indicates an acute complete infarction. When you see an ST elevation, you need to activate a cath lab immediately. So, what does ST elevation look like on an EKG? So, let's start our analysis of this EKG by using Rahibi. Let's start off with the rhythm. The rhythm appears regular. Next, let's look at the rate. The rate appears to be about 55 beats per minute. Now, axis. Axis appears normal. Next, is there evidence of hypertrophy? No, there does not seem to be any evidence of significant hypertrophy. Now, let's look for the signs of infarction. When looking for ST deviations, either elevations or depressions, Always compare the ST segment to the TP segment, the end of the T wave to the beginning of the P. In this EKG, we can see that leads 2, 3, and AVF have an elevated ST segment, ST elevation. Thus, this patient is having an acute myocardial infarction. What is the next step for this patient? To activate the cath lab this patient will need a left heart cath immediately. Now let's talk about right and left bundle branch blocks. We won't go into details about bundle branch blocks, but know that a block is present if the QRS complex is greater than 0.12 seconds, or three small boxes. It is always key to compare new and old EKGs to see new findings. If you do see a new left bundle branch block, with a history that is convincing for an acute coronary syndrome, 
then that would be an ST elevation equivalent. And you would need to contact your cardiologist to activate the cath lab. Now note that if a patient does have an old left bundle branch block, you cannot give an interpretation of the ST segment, whether it is elevated or skew the ST segment, preventing from an accurate reading pressed because a bundle branch block will in this EKG you can tell right away that the QRS complex is greater than three small boxes so this patient has a bundle branch block now if this is new this is an ST segment elevation equivalent and a cath lab should be activated or if this is old there should be a clinical correlation to see if it's acute coronary syndrome now that we talked about the various findings in acute coronary syndrome, let's review the keys to identifying acute coronary syndromes on the EKG. Remember, always compare to an old EKG to find new findings. Examine ST segments and look for new blocks. Look for T-wave inversions. Always obtain cardiac markers. If the clinical story and EKG findings are not convincing for an acute coronary syndrome, Look for other causes of chest pain. Differentiate between a true MI versus a troponin leak. Are the troponin elevations truly high, or is it just strain put on the heart by such things like hypertension? Always evaluate for evidence or history of recent bleeds. Because acute coronary syndromes need to be anticoagulated, those with recent bleeds have a poor outcome if anticoagulated. Now, let's try to understand how to stratify patients with an acute coronary syndrome based on the morbidity and mortality. We do this by using the TIMI risk score, which looks at various risk factors for these patients. The following are the risk factors in the TIMI risk score. An age greater than 65 years old, a patient with greater than three risk factors for coronary artery disease, like family history, hypertension, diabetes, a known history of coronary artery stenosis of greater than 50%, either on a previous cath or a cardiac scan, severe angina with greater than two episodes, aspirin use in the past seven days, positive cardiac markers, ST changes, either depression or elevation greater than 0 0.5 millimeters. Patients with 0 to Two of these are considered mild. Patients with three to four are considered in the moderate category of morbidity and mortality, and those with greater than four are considered severe. Calculating a patient's TIMI risk score will help guide your therapy. Now let's talk about the management of acute coronary syndromes. We will now discuss the treatment of acute coronary syndromes. Keep in mind that the medications and procedures we describe are in no particular order. And when you have an acute coronary syndrome patient, the first steps once it's diagnosed are aspirin, heparin, Plavix, and then cath. All other medical management should come after the catheterization if it's an ST elevation. Otherwise, you can do medical management prior to the cath. The first step for an acute coronary syndrome patient is to provide them with aspirin. We give a full dose of aspirin for acute coronary syndrome. That's 325 milligrams, and it does not matter whether it is enterocoded or not. Second, we give the patient heparin, either through a heparin drip or low molecular weight sub-Q heparin. Heparin drip is usually preferred because it can easily be turned off if the patient develops a bleed, while low molecular weight sub-Q heparin has a longer half-life. Thus, if a patient starts to open bleeding, it takes a lot to reverse them. Remember that if a patient has already been started on a low, low molecular weight heparin, continue with that and do not switch to heparin drip unless it's greater than 12 hours. Otherwise, the patient will be super anticoagulated and higher risk for bleeds. Another medication, the checklist of meds that a acute coronary syndrome patient should receive are beta blockers. Keep in mind, a patient in acute coronary syndrome is in pain. Thus, they'll increase their sympathetic drive and cause the heart rate to beat faster and thus increase oxygen demand. Beta blockers will decrease their heart rate, decreasing oxygen demand. Once 
you've heparinized the patient, given the aspirin, the patient should be taken for a left heart catheterization. Depending on the findings of the left heart cath, you'll medically manage the patient. If they receive a ventriculogram in the left heart cath, then you can think about an ACE or an ARB. If the patient has EF dysfunction, then you start them on an ACE or ARB, given that they have no acute kidney injury or chronic kidney disease. Usually an EF less than 40% warrants them to have an ACE or ARB on board. Like we talked about before, a patient with acute coronary syndrome needs to be placed on Plavix or Clopidogrel. Clopidogrel should be dosed usually at 300 milligrams initially as a bolus and then continue at 75 milligrams Q day post catheterization. Now, if a patient is already on Plavix and they've been taking it, they do not need to be rebolused. The second thing is, if you know the patient's going to be cath within the next six hours, you can actually give a 600 milligram bolus prior to the catheterization. Again, always make sure that the patient does not have a history of bleeding, as this will promote bleeding in patients who have a history of, of such things like esophageal varices or gastric ulcers that have bled in the past. The next important drug that we need to talk about are statins. Statins are drugs that we usually use to lower lipid levels, like Crestor or Lipitor. In acute coronary syndromes, they actually have an interesting role. Not only do they lower lipids, but statins have an anti-inflammatory effect on the clot or occlusion within the vessel, preventing from further occlusion or worsening occlusion within that vessel. Thus, make sure to always start statins on patients who can tolerate and do not have allergies to statins. Now, we went over the basics of acute coronary syndrome, so you should be well prepared now to diagnose acute coronary syndrome. If you like this series of podcasts, give it a like. Um, if you have any questions or comments about this video, other details you want to know about, place the comments down below. And if you like the podcast that you have seen in the past, as well as this one, make sure to subscribe to this channel. Also, you can check out my website at medpulse.org, M-E-D-P-U-L-S-E dot O-R-G. And also, these podcasts are also on iTunes, so look for MedPulse on iTunes if you want to download it to your iPhone. This is Dr. K from iMedical School. See you next time.